Well, I've never had much luck with men. I've just, um, they've either divorced me, died, or just walked off. It's not easy for a woman in this sort of area to, to survive on her own. Well, what other options did I have? I had to have some way of keeping a roof over my head. Anyway, I've got a bit of a reputation around here and, um, and that's why I've down at the, been going down to the well just at midday. It's, um, it's hot then, but, um, but at least I avoid the sort of those judgmental looks from the, the local women. I can avoid those respectable people who seem to sort of think that they're a, a bit above me. I can avoid their, their snide comments behind their hands. It's hot, but I can get my water in peace. And so that's when I usually go. The other week when I was down at the well, last week, I, I noticed that there was a man sitting in the shade just resting near the well. I was just going to walk straight past him and, um, and just go and get my water, but he spoke to me. Now, you might not think that strange, but where I come from, men just do not speak to women on their own in a public place. It's just not done. And so you could have really knocked me over with a feather. Not only did he, not only was he a man and I'm a woman, but he was a Jewish man and I'm a Samaritan woman. The Jews don't like us Samaritans. They tend to really look down their noses at us. They seem to think they're a bit better than us. And they'll do they'll do anything to avoid us, really. So the fact that he spoke to me really surprised me. He spoke to me and he asked me, could I give him some water? I was really shocked and I said to him, how come you're a Jewish man and you're asking me, a Samaritan woman, for water? And that's what he said to me, if you knew the gift of God who was asking you for water, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. <laughs> well, that was ridiculous. I knew how deep this well was and he didn't even have anything to draw the water out with. How was he going to get me any water, let alone living water? And so I said to him, like, what... What do you mean? What, what? And that's when he made it clear to me that he wasn't talking about the water in this well, but he was talking about something quite different. He said, the war, anyone who drinks of this water, the water that comes out of this well, will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him, it will come like come like a spring welling up inside them to eternal life. Well, that sounded pretty good to me. I'm the person who's got to come down to this well every day to get water. It's a drudgery. I thought, oh, I like the sound of that water. So I said, oh, give me some of that. This was turning to be a very strange conversation and it just suddenly got stranger because then he said to me, well, go and get your husband and bring him back. He obviously didn't know my history and I wasn't going to illuminate him. I wasn't going to let him know. So I just said to him, look, I haven't got a husband. And that's when he dropped the bombshell. He said, yeah, I know you haven't got a husband. You've had five husbands and the man you are with now isn't your husband. Oh, there's no way he could have known that. No way. 
who was this man? I could see that he was someone quite different. He must be some sort of prophet or something. This conversation was getting far too personal for comfort and yet I was just fascinated by this man and I wanted to hear more about what he had to say. So I thought, I'll just change the subject a little bit. I'll just, just move it away from me to perhaps something else. I thought, I know what, I'll get him talking about the religious differences between the Jews and Samaritans. He's a teacher. That'll really get him going. Yeah, he didn't take the bait. But he said instead, a time will come when, when we won't, doesn't matter where we worship, because God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This was going way over my head. I was starting to really just think, oh, goodness, I, I, this is getting a bit too complicated for me. And so I said, I know that the Messiah, the Saviour, is coming. And when he comes, he'll be able to explain all this to us. And that's when he said who he was. He said, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I'm that Messiah. Whoa, that's amazing. Just then, when things were getting really interesting, his friends came back. It looked like they'd been into town to get some food. They had a bit of food with them. It looks like they were going to have a picnic. And so I was not really comfortable to be there with all those blokes. And also, I had to get back to town to tell them about this, to tell them this really important news. And so I left my water jar there at the well and I rushed back into town. I said, come, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. And they did. They came out and they met Jesus. Some of them said that they believed because what I said, but others said that they believed because they'd met the Saviour for themselves. Find my glasses now, so. <laughs> Well, I'm back. <laughs> so, I, how, what an amazing story that is. And before, we, before I start this next section, I'm just going to pray and ask that God would speak to our hearts as we go. So, Father God, what I know of you will only ever be a fraction of who you are. Jesus, open our minds to see you and to understand the scriptures. Spirit, move our hearts from familiar to fascinated until, it is set, until our hearts are set ablaze by your unfailing love. Amen. So we want God, God to move our hearts from familiar to fascinated as we look at his word and we, and we look at a story that's very familiar to us but is so many important truths for us today. I bet that Samaritan woman would be absolutely amazed if she knew that we were still talking about her testimony over 2,000 years later. Isn't it incredible that we're here still hearing about this story such a long time later? This is one of the longest conversations Jesus has with anyone in the Bible. And it's amazing that it's with a woman and with a woman from Samaria. We're going to look at three things. We're going to look at one, this surprising encounter. Two, Jesus' generous offer. And three, Jesus' amazing disclosures. So let's look at this surprising encounter first of all. 
I love the way that Jesus treats this woman. She's probably been on the outer for years and years. She's been let down, disappointed and spurned by the men in her life. She probably struggles to make ends meet. She doesn't have a servant girl to come down and collect the water for the well. She has to do the hard yakka of all that work herself. She's somebody who's been looked down on by her society. And the fact that she's there at the well on her own, which would often have been a social sort of gathering place for the women, indicates that she was probably very socially isolated. So she's, yes, yeah, so she's a woman on the outer. This is no chance encounter. Jews tended to look down on the Samaritans. They'd come from the same family background, but the Samaritan side of the family had intermarried with the surrounding nations and they'd picked up a lot of their cultural practices. They'd sort of been influenced by the foreign gods and the Jews looked down on them and despised them. They tended to avoid them and they certainly wouldn't use the same eating or drinking utensils. Geez, they would normally have, if they were travelling from Galilee to Judea or the other way around, they would normally have taken the much longer route around to avoid even putting their feet on Samaritan soil. Jesus was travelling from Judea to Galilee and he deliberately chose to travel through Samaria. This was no chance encounter. John in, in the Gospel, John says that Jesus had to go that way. Jesus deliberately starts up a conversation with the woman. He asks her for water. It's really totally unexpected behaviour. Men didn't talk to women in public places. Jewish men didn't talk to Samaritan women in particular. And Jesus was a teacher. He was a person of some status I guess and so it was very unexpected that he would speak to a woman. He asks her for something and in so doing he puts himself under obligation to her. He's really putting himself in a position of need and asking for her help. She's naturally very surprised and she, make, and she says you know why are you speaking to me? And that's when he makes his generous offer. He takes her very seriously. He doesn't actually ask, answer her questions, but he draws her into a conversation with him and he stimulates her curiosity and he's bringing to a point where she realises that she's thirsty. She's thirsty not for this water, the water from the well, but she's thirsty for God. In verse 10, Jesus says, If you knew the gift of God who was asking you, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. Jesus' real reason for talking to the woman is not to get a drink, although I'm sure he was thirsty, but it was to give her something. He wanted to give her something which was even more important. Actually, it's funny, I don't know if Jesus ever got his drink of water, <laughs> whether they were too busy talking. So, but, um, but he certainly wanted to give her something. He makes it clear that he's not talking about the water in the well that they're there, but he's talking about something different. He says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I give him will never thirst. It will become like a spring welling up inside them to eternal life. Living water, I, I've really puzzled over this all this week and thinking, what does that mean? What, what's that phrase mean? And I really feel like I haven't got a proper handle on it yet. But the idea of living water is moving water. It's it's. You know when you can walk past a stagnant pond and it looks a bit dead and perhaps a bit smelly, it, you wouldn't even dream of drinking in that water. But living water is moving water. It's that idea about living fresh, 
It's water that gives life. It's life-giving water. It's water that nourishes. It's, it's, he's talking about something that's spiritual, not something that's physical. So he's talking about water that nourishes the heart and the soul, something that nourishes our inner being. Water is often used in the, in the Bible to talk about spiritual life. I love this image in Isaiah 58, 11, and it says, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your need in a sun-scorched land and strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Now, we've had so much rain recently that I think we almost forget what it was like. Do you know, I can't, was it five or six years ago when, when it was just so dry? Do you remember when, you, when every lawn you looked at was brown and dying? I went through the whole summer with practically not having to mow my lawn once. We were collecting water in the shower to water our plants, trying to keep them alive. Do you remember how there was to be a cloud in the sky and you'd be thinking, oh, is, that, is that the possibility of rain? We longed for rain. We longed for water. How beautiful it is when there's water and you can water your garden. It's beautiful and it's fruitful. And Jesus is talking about water that gives nourishment to our inner being to our, and life to our inner being. Jesus doesn't get impatient when the woman doesn't seem to quite understand him. When she says, oh, yeah, give me some of that. When she just sort of sees that this might be the end to her daily drudgery of coming down to the well. He doesn't get impatient, but he still wants to draw her into this conversation. And that's when he makes some amazing disclosures. He tells her to call her husband. He knows full well what her history is. This is no surprise to him. I don't pick up any sense of judgment at all. And this is the amazing thing in this story. Jesus knows what she's like. She knows He knows her history, her tainted history. But there's no sense of judgment. He's motive is not to expose her questionable past but rather to show her who he is he wants her to understand that i know you i understand and he wants her to understand that he is somebody who is pretty special he knows he reveals a depth of knowledge about her that is disturbing. And she quickly tries to deflect him. But she, I don't think she feels any sense of rejection. She's still there, hooked, wanting to know more. She's really, I think she's still very engaged in this conversation. I'm reminded about Psalm 139, um, which is just a beautiful psalm which talks about how God knows us. It says, God, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou searchest out my thoughts from afar. Thou knowest when I... So I've probably got it a bit muddled. Thou search me and know me. You know when I sit down and what rise up. You discern my lying down. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. And you're familiar with all my ways. Fancy that. God is familiar with all our ways. He knows our thoughts. He knows our habits. He knows us through and through. How amazing that is. Jesus knew this woman. Step by step, he's leading her on into a journey towards truth. He's engaging her in a very serious conversation about life and about God. It's then that Jesus moves on to his second disclosure. When things get personal, she attempts a bit of deflection and 
with her question about the right places to worship. But Jesus is not lured into a discussion about the trappings and traditions of religion. But he indicates that something really new is on the way, something different. And he said the time is coming when people will worship God in spirit and in truth. It's not a matter whether you worship them in this church or that church or this place or that church. It's going to be important that we worship God in spirit and in truth. Because God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. She's some, this is getting a bit above her head and she starts, so then she brings up the conversation about the Messiah. She says, I know the Messiah, the promised saviour that God has promised through the generations is one day going to come. And when that saviour comes, that saviour will explain everything. And that's when Jesus says who he is. That's when Jesus knows that she's ready. And he says, I, I the one speaking to you, I am he. How amazing. I think that this woman's life is genuinely changed. This isn't just, he hasn't just given her information, but she's met the saviour. It's not just head knowledge but she's actually encountered and met the Saviour. I think we can see that her life has changed because this woman who's been shunned by her society and isolated suddenly develops a heart for the people in her village. She suddenly realises that they've got to hear this message. I've got to tell them. And she's so excited that to get there that she, and she doesn't want Jesus to have moved on and gone and kept on on his journey, she knows that it's urgent that she gets them there. And so she leaves her water jar and dashes into the town to go and get the, the people from the village. She tells them, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. And they do. I wonder what you get out of all of this? Do you sometimes feel uncared for on the outer, worthless, inadequate, ashamed and guilty? She did and I know that we often do too. Jesus knew this woman in all her struggles and sinfulness and he loved her. He loves each of us in that same way. Is your life sometimes dry, empty, unsatisfied? Do you get caught up with the humdrum of just every day the same? Jesus' gift of living water is what he offered to her and it's available to each of us. If you had asked me, it's a gift. It wasn't anything she had to work for she didn't have to come down and draw the water out of the well to get this living water. It's a gift. If you'd asked me, I would give you this water that would be like a well willing, welling up inside you to eternal life. Let's ask Jesus that he would give us this living water. I think Jesus is talking not about He's not talking about physical water, but he's talking about a relationship with God. A relationship with God that wells up inside us, that will give spiritual life to our dead hearts. I became a Christian when I was quite young. It was, I was probably nine or ten. And that's when I accepted this gift of life that God offered. And I have to say, it has become a spring of water welling up inside me to eternal life. That fact that I can know God, his love and his fellowship through my life has changed me over the years. It's influenced how I relate to others and it's sustained me 
through tough times and through good times. God has nourished me over the years with that living water. And he wants to do that for each of us. And as I've been preparing this week, I've been saying, Lord, just help me to just know more of that living water welling up inside me. It's something that we can know more and more of each day. Let's be asking God that he would nourish us with that living water. And if you haven't received that living water from him, he wants to give you life. He wants to bring you into relationship with God. You only have to ask. Let's just pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. Thank you for the way that you showed us and the way that you related to this woman, a woman who was on the outskirts of society, who felt shame and, and really rejection. And yet you loved her and accepted her. You made this journey to meet her. Thank you that this message of salvation is for all. It wasn't just for the Jews, but it was for the people, for the Samaritans and for us Gentiles. Thank you that you have, um, thank you that you give us living water to sustain and nourish us. And we just, um, yeah, we're just so grateful for your goodness and for your love and that we can know you, the living Saviour. In Jesus' name, Amen.